burning. I've heard you talk about this gorilla problem. What mm-hmm. is the gorilla problem as a way to understand AI in the context of humans? So, so the gorilla problem is, is the problem that gorillas face with respect to humans. So you can imagine that, you know, a few million years ago, the, the human line branched off from the gorilla line in evolution. Uh, and now the gorillas are looking at the human line and saying, yeah, what, was that a good idea? And they have, no, um, they have no say in whether they continue to exist. Because we have a... We are much smarter than they are. If we chose to, we could make them extinct in, in a couple of weeks. And there's nothing they can do about it. So that's the gorilla problem, right? Just the, the problem a species faces you know, when there's another species that's much more capable. And so this says that intelligence is actually the single most important factor to control planet Earth. Yes, intelligence is the ability to bring about what you want in the world. And we're in the process of making something more intelligent than us. Exactly. Which suggests that maybe we become the gorillas. Exactly, yeah. Is, that, is there any fault in the reasoning there? Because it seems to make such perfect sense to me, but if it, why doesn't... Why don't people stop then? Because it it seems like a crazy thing to want to... Because they think that uh, if they create this technology, it will have enormous economic value. They'll be able to use it to replace all the human workers in the world, uh, to develop new uh, products, drugs, um, forms of entertainment, any anything that has economic value, you could use AGI to... To create it. And and maybe it's just an irresistible thing in itself, right? I think we as humans place so much store on our intelligence, you know, on, you know, how we think about, you know, what is the pinnacle of human achievement. If we had AGI, we could go way higher than that. So it, it's very seductive for people to want to create this technology. And I think people are just fooling themselves if they think it's naturally going to be controllable. I mean, the question is, how are you going to retain power forever over entities more powerful than yourself? Pull the plug out. People say that sometimes in the comment section when we talk about AI. They say, well, I'll just pull the plug out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of funny. In fact, you know, yeah, reading the comment sections in newspapers, whenever there's an AI article, there'll be people who say, oh, you can just pull the plug out, right? As if a super intelligent machine would never have thought of that one. <laughs> right? I mean, don't forget, it's watched all those films where they did try to pull the plug out. Another thing they say, well, you know, as long as it's not conscious, then it doesn't matter. It won't ever do anything. Um, which is completely off the point because, you know, I I don't think the gorillas are sitting there saying, oh, yeah, you know, if only those humans hadn't been conscious, everything would be fine, right? No, of course not. What would make gorillas go extinct is the things that humans do, right? How we behave, our ability to act successfully in the world. So when I play chess against my iPhone and I lose, right? I don't, I don't think, oh, well, I'm losing because it's conscious, right? No, I'm just losing because it's better than I am at, at, in that little world, uh, moving the bits around uh, to, to get what it wants. And, and so consciousness has nothing to do with it, right? Competence is the thing we're concerned about. So I think the only hope is, can we simultaneously build machines that are more intelligent than us, but guarantee that they will always act in our best interest. So throwing that question to you, can we build machines that are more intelligent than us that will also always act in our best interests? It sounds like a bit of a uh, contradiction to some degree, because it's kind of like me saying, I've got a French bulldog called Pablo that's uh, Mm -hmm. nine years old. And it's like saying that he could be more intelligent than me, 
yet I still walk him and decide when he gets fed. I think if he was more intelligent than me, he would be walking me. I'd be on the leash. That's the, that's the trick, right? Can we make AI systems whose only purpose is to further human interests? And I think the answer is yes. And this is actually what I've been working on. So I, I think one part of my career that I didn't mention is, is sort of having this epiphany uh, while I was on sabbatical in Paris. This was 2013 or so. Just realizing that further progress in the capabilities of AI, uh, you know, if, if we succeeded in creating real superhuman intelligence, that it was potentially a catastrophe. And so I pretty much switched my focus to work on how do we make it so that it's guaranteed to be safe. Are you somewhat troubled by everything that's going on at the moment with, with AI and how it's progressing? Because you strike me as someone that's somewhat troubled under the surface by the way things are moving forward and the speed in which they're moving forward. That's an understatement. I'm appalled, actually, by the lack of attention to safety. I mean, imagine if someone's building a nuclear power station in your neighborhood. And you go along to the chief engineer and you say, okay, these nuclear things, I've heard that they can actually explode, right? There was this nuclear explosion that happened in Hiroshima. And so I'm a bit worried about this. You know, what steps are you taking to make sure that we don't have a nuclear explosion in our backyard? And the chief engineer says, well, we thought about it. We don't really have an answer. Yeah. You would, what would you say? <laughs> I think you would, you would use some expletives. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and you'd call your MP and say, you know, get these, protest. get these people out. I mean, what are they doing? You read out the list of, you know, projected dates for AGI. But notice also that those people, I think I mentioned Dara Amade says a 25% chance of extinction. Elon Musk has a 30% chance of extinction. Sam Altman says basically that AGI is the biggest risk to human existence. So what are they doing? They are playing Russian roulette with every human being on earth without our permission. They're coming into our houses, putting a gun to the head of our children pulling the trigger and saying, well, you know, possibly everyone will die. Oops. But possibly we'll get incredibly rich. That's what they're doing. Did they ask us? No. Why is the government allowing them to do this? Because they dangle $50 billion checks in front of the governments. So I think troubled under the surface is an understatement. What would be an accurate statement? appalled. And I, I am devoting my life to trying to divert from this course of history into a different one. Do you have any regrets about things you could have done in the past? Because you've been so influential on the subject of AI, you wrote the textbook that many of these people would have studied on the subject of AI more than 30 years ago. Do you, do you ha when you're alone at night and you think about decisions you've made on this in this field because of your scope of influence, is there anything you, you regret? Well, I do wish I had understood earlier uh, what I understand now. We could have developed safe AI systems. I think the there are some weaknesses in the framework, which I can explain, but I think that framework could have evolved to develop actually safe AI systems where we could prove mathematically that the system is going to act in our interests. The kind of AI systems we're building now, we don't understand how they work. We don't understand how they work. It's, it's a strange thing to build something where you don't understand how it works. I mean, there's no sort of comparable through human history. Usually with machines, we can pull it apart and see what cogs are doing what and how the Well, actually, we, <laughs> we put the cogs together, right? So with, with most machines, we designed it to have a certain behavior. So we don't need to pull it apart and see what the cogs are because we put the cogs in there in the first place, right? One by one, we figured out what, what the pieces needed to be, 
how they work together to produce the effect that we want. So the best analogy I can come up with is, you know, the, the first cave person who left a bowl of fruit in the sun and forgot about it and then came back a few weeks later and there was a, sort of this big soupy thing and they drank it and got completely shit-faced. They got drunk. Because, okay. <laughs> and they got this effect. They had no idea how it worked, but they were very happy about it. And no doubt that person made a lot of money from it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it is kind of bizarre, but my mental picture of these things is, is like a chain link fence, right? So you've got lots of these connections and uh, each of those connections can be, its connection strength can be adjusted. And then, uh, you know, a signal comes in one end of this chain link fence and passes through all these connections and comes out the other end. And the signal that comes out the other end is affected by your adjusting of all the connection strengths. So what you do is you, you get a whole lot of training data and you adjust all those connection strengths so that the signal that comes out the other end of the network is the right answer to the question. So if your training data is lots of photographs of animals, then all those pixels go in one end of the network and out the other end, you know, it, it activates the llama output or the dog output or the cat output or the ostrich output. And, uh, and so you just keep adjusting all the connection strengths in this network until the outputs of the network are the ones you want. But we don't really know what's going on across all of those different chains. So what's going on inside that network? Well, so now you have to imagine that this network, it, this chain link fence is, is a thousand square miles in extent. Okay. So it's covering the whole of the San Francisco Bay Area or the whole of London inside the M25, right? That's how big it is. And the lights are off, it's nighttime. <laughs> so you might have in that network about a trillion uh, adjustable parameters, and then you do quintillions or sextillions of small random adjustments to those parameters uh, until you get the behavior that you want. I've heard Sam Altman say that in the future, he doesn't believe they'll need much training data at all to make these models progress themselves, because there comes a point where the models are so smart that they can train themselves and improve themselves without us needing to pump in articles and books and scour the internet. Yeah, it should, it should work that way. So I think what he's referring to, and this is something that several companies are now worried might start happening, is that the AI system becomes capable of doing AI research by itself. And so uh, you have a system with a certain capability. I mean, crudely, we could call it an IQ, but it's, it's not really an IQ. But anyway, imagine that it's got an IQ of 150 and uses that to do AI research, comes up with better algorithms or better designs for hardware or better ways to use the data, updates itself. Now it has an IQ of 170. And now it does more AI research, except that now it's got an IQ of 170. So it's even better at doing the AI research. And so, you know, next iteration, it's 250 and, uh, and so on. So this, this is an idea that one of Alan Turing's friends, I.J. Good, uh, wrote out in 1965 called the intelligence explosion, right? That one of the things an intelligence system could do is to do AI research and therefore make itself more intelligent. And this would, uh, this would very rapidly take off and leave the humans far behind. Is that what they call the fast takeoff? That's called the fast takeoff. Sam Altman said, I think a fast takeoff is more possible than I thought a couple of years ago, which I guess is that moment where the AGI starts teaching itself. Mm. In, and in his blog, The Gentle Singularity, he said, we may already be past the event horizon of takeoff. And what does, what does he mean by event horizon? The event horizon is, is a phrase borrowed from astrophysics, and it refers to uh, the black hole. And the event horizon, think if you've got some very, very massive object that's heavy enough that it actually prevents light from escaping. That's why it's called the black hole. It's so heavy that light can't escape. So if you're inside the event horizon, then 
then light can't escape beyond that. So I think what he's what he's meaning is if we're beyond the event horizon, it means that you know now we're just trapped in the gravitational attraction of the black hole, or in this case, we're we're trapped in the inevitable slide, if you want, towards AGI. When you when you think about the economic value of AGI, which I've estimated at uh, 15 quadrillion dollars, that acts as a giant magnet in the future. We're being pulled towards it. We're being pulled towards it. And the closer we get, the stronger the force. The probability, you know, the closer we get, the, par- the, the higher the probability that we will actually get there. So people are more willing to invest. And we also start to see spinoffs from that investment, such as ChatGPT, right, which is, you know, generates a certain amount of revenue and so on. So, so it does act as a magnet. And the closer we get, the harder it is to pull out of that field. It's interesting when you think that this could be the, the end of the human story, this idea that the end of the human story was that we created our successor. Like we, we summoned our the next iteration of life or intelligence ourselves. Like we took ourselves out. It is quite, like just removing ourselves and the catastrophe from it for a second, it is, it is an unbelievable story. Yeah, and, you know, there are many legends, the sort of be careful what you wish for legend. And in fact, the King Midas legend is is very relevant here. What's that? So King Midas is this legendary king who lived in modern day Turkey, but I think is sort of like Greek mythology. He is said to have asked the gods to grant him a wish. The wish being that everything I touch should turn to gold. So he's incredibly greedy. Uh, you know, and we call this the Midas touch. And we think of the Midas touch as being like, you know, that's a good thing, right? Wouldn't that be cool? But what happens? So he, uh, you know, he goes to drink some water and he finds that the water has turned to gold. And he goes to eat an apple and the apple turns to gold. And he goes to, you know, comfort his daughter and his daughter turns to gold. And so he dies in misery and starvation. So this applies to our current situation in in two ways, actually. So one is that I think greed is driving us to pursue a technology that will end up consuming us and we will perhaps die in misery and starvation instead. Though what it shows is how difficult it is to correctly articulate what you want the future to be like. For a long time, the way we built AI systems was we created these algorithms where we could specify the objective and then the machine would figure out how to achieve the objective and then achieve it. So, you know, we specify what it means to win at chess or to win at Go, and the algorithm figures out how to do it uh, and it does it really well. So that was, you know, standard AI up until recently. And it suffers from this drawback that, sure, we know how to specify the objective in chess, but how do you specify the objective in life, right? What do we want the future to be like? Well, really hard to say. And almost any attempt to write it down precisely enough for the machine to bring it about would be wrong. And if you're giving a machine an objective which isn't aligned with what we truly want the future to be like, right, you're actually setting up a chess match. And that match is one that you're going to lose when the machine is sufficiently intelligent. And so that, that's, that's problem number one. Problem number two is that the kind of technology we're building now, we don't even know what its objectives are. So it's not that we're specifying the objectives, but we're getting them wrong. We're growing these systems. They have objectives, but we don't even know what they are because we didn't specify them. What we're finding through experiment with them is that they seem to have an extremely strong